I, uh, I named this message from the whipping post to the cross and casting our cares upon him. Amen. So life can be tough. Amen. It can be troubling. It can be scary at some times. There will be times that we just be don't believe that anybody is going to be there for us. Amen. Or that anybody even cares. The majority of people live their lives in a quiet desperation. There's a lot of people out there, both born again and not born again, that are filled with insecurities, doubts, anger, and anxiety. Some of us have a fear of being sued. Some have a fear of finishing last. Some have what seems like a simple fear of getting a mole in the back, in your back, you know. I know a guy, when he gets a mole on his back, he rushes to the doctor to get it removed. <laughs> he doesn't want any moles on, him, on his body. He fears, he fears the effects of having a mole on his body. Some of us fear the, the sound of a clock, right, as it ticks us closer to the grave. We have investment plans for retirement. We install sophisticated security systems. Some fear losing our jobs. Sometimes we fear even getting a new boss. Some of us stress over where, how we're going to pay the next bill. Some of us are in fear of the next doctor's report. Sometimes fear and worry can creep in so slow that we don't even realize we are being oppressed until the oppression or depression is so great and overwhelming that we feel so hopeless that we are willing to try anything that the world has to offer to make the oppression stop. Sometimes we turn to pills or other forms of drugs. Sometimes we feel to alcohol or even a, a sexual promiscuous lifestyle. But we need to learn to turn to Christ. Amen. So this, this whole idea of casting our cares upon the Lord, where, where do we get that from out of the scriptures? So I'd like to go through a couple of scriptures here that show where we get that from and why we have the right and the authority or power to be able to do that. So 1 Peter 5, 6 through 9. The scripture says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seek him, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resi resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in this world. So here the scripture is telling us to cast our cares upon him, cast our cares upon the Lord. Now one thing, uh, some, some translations use anxiety. But one thing we're told here is that we're to cast our care, our anxiety upon the Lord. Right Now the scripture wouldn't tell us to do that if we didn't have the ability to do that. Amen. The other thing is, I'd like to point out, it says the devil as a roaring lion, right? He is not a roaring lion. He appears to be a roaring lion. Sometimes his oppression, uh, his attacks seem so great, but yet he's already been defeated. We just have to position our minds where we know where the attack is coming from and that there's victory and we can walk in it and live it. Amen. We don't have to be subject to this anxiety, these fears, these oppressions that we get hit with. And the other thing in this scripture I'd like to point out is sometimes we feel that we're the only ones that are going through this and no one understands. Amen. But if you look here, it's telling us that there are other, there's 
then others, and there are others in our brotherhood, in our family, that are being oppressed by these same type of things. You're not the only one going through it. And there's been others that have come through it, so you have hope that you can come through it too. Don't feel as though there's no escape, that you're stuck in it, okay? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24 through 27, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan, to his span of life? So all your anxiety, all your worries, isn't going to add anything to your life, will it? Matter of fact, it'll take away from your life, right? These anxieties and fears that we struggle with can be so oppressive we don't eat right, can cause chemical imbalances in our stomachs, you know, give us ulcers, all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Push us into uh, drug use and things that could rob us of our lives, right? Uh, cause us to treat others in a wrong way, you know, maybe be more uh, snapping at our, our spouse or our children or our parents, right? And that effect on our lives affects those around us. So, well, the anxiety and fear that we allow into our lives affects those around us, right? So we want to we want to try to come to a place where we can walk and how to surrender these things to the Lord and why He and what He did. The, uh, I think one of the things we need to understand is what He did to take these things away. Amen. So where did Peter get the confidence to tell us to, that we can cast our cares upon the Lord? And where did Jesus get the authority to take our cares? <coughs> Amen. What happened that caused him to be able to do that for us? And I'd like to look at some scriptures here that expound on that a little bit. And one of the, the first scriptures I'd like to look at is Isaiah 53, chapter 53, verse 4. Now, Isaiah 53, Isaiah was a prophet. He prophesied the coming of the Messiah and what he was coming to do and what he was going to do. But for me to read the whole chapter and get into everything, I don't feel as I have enough time. So I want to I expound on a couple of the key verses. And in verse 4 it says, Surely, this is talking about Jesus, He, Jesus, hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now I like to look at that word born, okay, because the... The, Eng the English language and things that the Bible was written in, some of the definitions have changed a little bit. If you look at, if you find an old English uh, Webster dictionary, like the Christian Heritage Dictionary, and you look at that, and then you look at some of the words that are in the uh, modern Webster uh, dictionary, they're a little different. So this word born here is to lift up, take away, be carried off be swept away. The word grief here, griefs, refers to anxiety, calamity, disease, and sickness. The word carry means to bear, a load, drag one self along to carry. The word sorrow refers to pain, physical, and mental affliction, grief. So what this verse is saying is that Jesus, right, this is the prophet Isaiah saying Jesus is coming to take away, to carry off, right, 
or griefs or anxiety or calamities or diseases or sicknesses that he bore, right? He bears the load of that. That pain, the physical and mental torment of it. Verse 11 says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. <coughs> By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So this is telling us that Jesus was coming to bear, right, to carry off, to drag away our iniquities, the punishment, the faults, right, our faults, the punishment, the anguish of it. Verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion of the great, and he, Jesus, shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So here again, we're told that Jesus has carried away, carried off, taken away our sin, the guilt of sin, our punishment for sin. Amen. So this word griefs and sorrow refer to sickness, weakness, disease, anxiety, grief, pain. Jesus has taken them. He's not bearing them with you. He's taken them away. You don't have to live in this anxiety and fear. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 24. For even hereunto we are called because Christ, right? Christ for us, he suffered for us. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was gal found in his mouth. Who when he was rivaled, rivaled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. So the thing that I'd like to point out here is when we go from the whipping post to the cross, right? The whipping post is what paid by his stripes we are healed. The whipping post is what Christ went through to take away our sorrows, to take away our grief, to take away our pain, our anxiety, right? To pay for our sickness and disease. The cross is what paid for our sins, okay? Now, bear, keep that thought... Keep that thought in mind. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So listen, Jesus left us something, right? He left us peace. Peace is the the opposite of anxiety, right? Peace is the opposite of depression and, uh, and oppression and things like that. He left it here for us. And his peace isn't like the world's peace, right? We try to find peace in drinking a beer or popping a pill or smoking a joint, you know. That's all temporary, right? And half the time when you get done with that stuff, it leaves you feeling more hopeless than what you were before, right? So what the Bible is saying is let not your hearts be troubled. Your hearts is, your heart, when it's referring to your heart, it's referring to your mind, will, and emotions, right? Let not your, your mind, will, and emotions be troubled, right? The Bible, again, wouldn't tell us to do something that we're not able to do, right? If we're not able 
in Christ, or if we're not able to uh, redirect our thoughts, redirect our emotions, then Jesus would have said, let not your heart be troubled, pick up a glass of wine and be merry, right? <laughs> he doesn't tell us to do that. He doesn't say, uh, let your heart not be troubled, smoke a joint and forget about it. That's not what he says. He says, let not your heart be troubled, right? He left us peace that we can walk in. Amen. Colossians 3.15. And I, and, and I tell you, like over the years I've talked to a lot of people, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, to pick on anybody or give anybody a hard time about their lifestyle. Uh, that's not the, the, mess, the point of the message, but I ran into a guy years ago, and we were, we were talking, and he was telling me how he deals, deals with anger, right? And he said that he's using uh, Xanax to deal with his anger. Every time he gets angry, angry, he has to take some Xanax. And I said to him, I said, you know, I said, I bet if you would sit down and read a proverb, you wouldn't have to pop that, that Xanax. And he looks at me and he goes, well, you're probably right. But you know what? He didn't want to take time to seek God on anything. He wanted to take. He wanted to f try to find peace the way the world offers peace. He just pop that Xanax, and let Xanax do its thing, you know. So here, here's a guy, and I and I realize that there may be some people with some issues where maybe they need to take some things to help them get to a point where they can be begin to walk in uh, the fullness of Christ. But there a lot of times we're intentionally not going to Christ. We don't want to be bothered with our relationship with him, right? We just want to do the quickest, easiest thing to make things disappear, and we don't want to endure through anything. Amen? So Colossians 3.15, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Listen, we need to realize and be thankful for what Christ paid for, right? What he paid for at the whipping post. And it says again, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace, right? It's there for us to obtain. Again, we wouldn't be told to let it rain if it wasn't available for us to let it rain, if we didn't have an option in doing it, right? God... God loves us, and he wants us to love him willingly, right? He doesn't force us to love him. He wants us to choose what he has for us. He doesn't want to force it into us. You have a choice whether you want to seek God on things or you want to seek the way of the world on things, right? It's your choice. But we need to learn to walk in the thankfulness of what Christ has done and appreciate it and receive it and turn things over to him that we can walk in these freedoms, right? Well, a lot of times, it, uh, so the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, which uh, we've touched on before, and I'm, uh, I, I believe uh, Preacher Paul has taught on it before, and Preacher Jim. But for, so, for though we walk in the flesh, that means we walk in this human body, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now I want to take a moment to expound on a stronghold, right? A stronghold is a mindset that's attached to a, an emotion. It's a belief that's attached to emotion, a false emotion, right? It's a belief system that uh, usually is formed because we don't know biblical truth and we go through an experience. And because of that experience, we lock our emotions, our thoughts, our belief systems into how that, the outcome of that experience has uh, turned out because we didn't know biblical truth to stand on. So when someone comes to us with biblical truth, sometimes it's hard for us to <coughs> grasp the truth and, and walk in that freedom that they're offering through the word of God, right? Because they have this stronghold, this 
this thing that's locked into their belief system because of a, an experience that they would had in the past. That's usually attached to an emotion. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So listen, Christ can break these strongholds, right? He can, he can change your belief system. He can help you walk in freedom. He can help you experience these things. We're supposed to cast down imaginations, right? Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So if we have a belief system that exalts itself against the word of God, then we need to cast it down. It doesn't matter what we feel our personal experience has been, right? The only reason our personal experience has been that way is because we didn't realize what the word of God was to begin with. Once we learn the word of God and we begin to understand what it's saying and we lock into that truth and we start walking in that truth, the experience changes, the outcome changes. Amen? We can walk in freedom. We don't have to be held captive to these vain imaginations that are filtering through our minds, right? These doubts, these unbeliefs, these anxieties, right? We can cast them down. I tell you, they, click, they, they sweep in so slow, right? A couple of weeks ago, I was getting hit with a lot of anxiety uh, about different things going on at my job, and just, just really getting hit with it, right? And once I realized it, like it came in so slow, right? So subtle. I didn't even realize it was anxiety, right? And then it just escalated to a point where uh, it's like God gave me some kind of revelation that this was anxiety, right? Like it was just felt so oppressive and so overwhelming. And I, but once I realized it, right, I renounced it, right? I said, anxiety, Satan, you ain't got no right in my life, right? It doesn't matter what happens here. God is in control, amen? It, it's him that directs my path, right? And if God's going to use some kind of situation to move me to another place or position, then so be it. He's in control of my life. You know what I'm saying? I, I turned it. Well, first I did as I renounced it, commanded it to cease in Jesus' name. Anxiety, you have no right here. You have no place here. Leave now in Jesus' name. Like sometimes it seems simple. It seems absurd. But listen, we can, we can speak to these things, right? A lot of these things is just like Satan creeping around like a roaring lion, right? Trying to oppress you, trying to get your thoughts off of Christ, right? Off of his victory, off of your right as a believer to walk in peace, to walk in joy in certain things that are going on in your life. Jesus didn't say he was going to take you out of the storm. He said he's going to give you peace in the midst of the storm, right? He's going to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding, right? No matter what you're going through in life, Christ has the peace and the power to bring you through in joy, right? And peace and comfort and confidence, amen? We, we need to learn how to capture these thoughts and cast them down when we recognize them, whether it's, a pre whether it's depression, whether it's desire to go out and sin, whether it's desire to, to turn to drugs or alcohol or immorality. Once we see it creeping in, we grab a hold of it and we say, no, you're not welcome in my life. Christ paid for this. I'm going to Christ for my peace, not you, right? And that can begin to manifest. It's there available. Amen. Next slide already. All right. So I have, I have some slides I wish I'd like to show you the kind of graphic. Has anybody ever seen the Passion of the Christ? Anybody ever see that? So I'd like, I'd like to encourage these guys. This is the season, right, where we recognize Christ, his death, his, his, and his burial and his resurrection, right? So just real quick, Christ was at the whipping post, right? He was whipped, right? He was bruised. He was beat. By his stripes, we are healed. He paid for our anxiety. He paid for, paid for our depression or our oppression. All that was taken care of at the whipping post, right? And then from there, they hung a, they hung a cross 
made him drag his own cross to the place where they were going to crucify him, right? And on that hill, they crucified him. On that hill, he died to pay for your sin debt. And this is what I believe the Lord showed me. You can do with it what you want. I believe the reason why Christ, and he sets everything up. You can say, well, the Roman Empire set it up this way or whatever. Uh, God's in control. Christ was whipped over here, right? He had to carry that cross all the way through the city and up on that hill to be crucified, right? And the reason I believe that that, that span of time was there, God placed that there, was for us to recognize that two different events happened. Amen. Over here, he was whipped, he was bruised, he paid for our anxiety, he paid for our sicknesses, our diseases, everything that we deal with, our emotional sorrows was dealt with over here at the whipping post. If he would have died before he wouldn't have got to the cross, that still would have been paid for. Amen. He made it to the cross because he wanted to, to pay for our sin debt, right? Christ raised him from the dead because he was victorious over sin and death, right? God was satisfied with the payment that Jesus Christ made for your sin. He was satisfied with the payment that he paid for your oppression and your depression, right? We don't have to live in it. We can walk in freedom. We can walk in victory. Amen. So these next couple of slides, I tell you, I, I, I was watching The Passion of Christ. I was watching the Jesus film. If you, look, if you Google Jesus film project, they have it, I don't know, in like 100 different languages. I watched the Jesus film. And I like, I like to do, I like, and I want to do it more often, right? Because sometimes we just kind of forget, right? And sometimes the reality of the whole thing just kind of slips us because of the, the ways of the world and the cares of the world. But just go ahead, already. If, if anybody uh, needs to step out, so. But this is uh, Christ at the whipping post, right? These. These fletches ripped him apart, man. Literally. Next slide, already. They say when they were done with him, there wasn't even an inch between each tear. He, you were on his mind <laughs> when he was being whipped. He knew what he was there for, right? He loves you. That's the peace that he had. He, he did this so you could walk in perfect peace. Amen. Don't let the devil or the world tell you any different. Next slide. This is him carrying the cross. That's marking the separation of the two events. Amen. Let me go to the next slide. And then the next one already. This is Christ crucified on the cross. You know that song, uh, <laughs> I heard uh, another preacher say it the other day, and I thought about it, I thought, you know what, he's right. And there's a song that says, I'll never know how much it costs to, to see my sin upon the cross. I think when you look at that, can you flip it back to the next one, the one before that? When you look at that, I don't know how you can say, I, I'll never know how much it costs. He was thinking of us, every one of you, when he paid for your sin on that cross. Amen. Go ahead, already to the next next one. The good news is he rose victorious from the grave. Amen. He, he rose victoriously from the grave. The Romans couldn't stop him. Satan couldn't stop him. Nobody could stop him. Amen. God was completely satisfied with the payment that he made for your sin debt. Amen. The next slide, Ori. This is a more up-to-date version of the picture. Amen. There was two thieves. Christ was crucified in the middle. There was a, a thief on the left and a thief on the right. Amen. The one mocked Christ 
as he was on the cross. The other one recognized him for Christ, asked him to forgive him, asked him to remember him when he got to his kingdom. Amen. And Jesus said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. This day, right? Listen, there is no pur purgatory when you die. When, you're, when, you're, when your spirit and your soul leave your body, you're going to one or two places. You're going to heaven or hell. Amen. You have to choose. <coughs> are you going to be the thief that mocks Christ? Or are you going to be the thief that surrenders to God? Right? doesn't matter what you've done in your past. Right? Jesus didn't say to the thief on the left, well, why didn't you ask a year ago? Why did you wait to the last minute when your last breath was leaving your body to turn to God? Listen, God, he doesn't care when you turn to him. I would recommend you turn to him now because it's going to save you and your, and your family and your friends a lot of grief, right? It's the wise choice. Choose Christ, man, in all your actions. Choose him as your Savior. Place your faith and trust 100% in him and him alone. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 can you flip that one up for you? Did you get a chance to do that? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth on the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made on the salvation. Oh, that's not Ephesians 2 and 9. That's Romans 10, 9 and 10. This is just as good. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? So listen, there's this thing we call we like to call it a sinner's prayer, right? Where we ask God to forgive us of our sin and place our faith and trust in him as our Savior. This A prayer won't save you, right? The confession with the mouth is a way to humble yourself before God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin, right? I'm placing my faith and trust in you that you... Uh, rose from the dead, that you defeated sin and death, that you paid for my sin debt in full, amen, and I'm fully trusting and relying on you, amen. And that, what Christ done, right, makes you righteous before God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says for grace, right, grace is on merited favor, it's something that we don't deserve. For grace you are saved through faith, your faith in what, your faith that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead. And that not of yourself it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can't work or buy a gift because it's already been paid for, right? If somebody buys you a birthday present, and they worked for the money, they earned the money, they paid for the gift. The only thing you can do is receive it. And that's what salvation is. Salvation is a free gift to you that Jesus Christ paid for. Amen. It's not of works, right? Lest any man should boast. So if I die and I stood before God and God said, Aaron, why should I let you into my heaven? And I said, well, you know, I, I taught Sunday school and I went to church every Sunday and I helped out down at the soup kitchen, right? That's something to boast about, right? It's something that I've done to try to pay for my right to be with God in heaven, right? My righteousness are as filthy rags. Amen. There's nothing I can do to remove my sin. It's what Christ did to, that removes our sin. Right? Once we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, the scripture says that we've been born again. That he is, we become a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Something that's never existed before. Amen. You may be thinking how, you know, I've tried, you know, I've tried praying to God and asking him to give me peace and I've tried this and I've tried that. Listen, surrender your heart to Christ, right? Place your faith and trust and confidence in him. Receive what Christ did for you. First step, get born again. Place your faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. Amen. Begin to develop your relationship with Christ, right? Begin to read the Word of God, get in Christian fellowship, come to places like CR, come to adult Sunday school, things like that. Get, 
to know who Christ is. Get to know the truth of the Word of God. Read your Bible, read your devotions, uh, find good, solid Christian, godly preachers on the radio or TV, listen to them, amen. Feed your mind with truth, right? For me, I stopped, just, just me, my own personal conviction, I stopped, I, I got rid of everything, right? I heard John Hagee preaching on cleaning your house, right? <laughs> Getting rid of everything that doesn't represent God in your house, right? I had karate, martial short certificates that had the little yin and yang symbols on them and all this stuff, I threw them all away, right? Worked a couple of years to get them, I threw them all away, right? At that point in my life, I threw away all my Harley Davidson t-shirts, right? <laughs> threw away like a $300 leather jacket, right? Uh, took all my music, all my videos, everything I had, and I threw it all. I, first, I tried selling my music to Ico Music Trading, right? And then I felt convicted I can't do that. It's just going to be recycled, recycled into population and poison other people. So I started busting them up and throwing them away so they couldn't poison anybody else, you know, for cheap. <laughs> so all that stuff, right, I threw it all away, got rid of it, didn't want nothing to do with it. I made a list of everything that I could think of that I was holding on to, whether it was hating somebody, anger at somebody, uh, things that have been done to me, things I did to other people, wrote them on a piece of paper, took them outside, and burned it. Amen. Just released it to God. Anybody that I heard, I asked the Lord to forgive me for it, and I asked them <coughs> to touch them and heal them and restore them, right? Give them peace about whatever happened, right? Just ask the Lord to intervene. Amen. People I felt hardship towards, I didn't feel like I could uh, forgive. I asked the Lord. Lord, you know I want to forgive them. I'm having a hard time with it. I release them to you. Help me forgive them. I release them to you to the best of my ability. Amen. I give them to you. Just give things to the Lord to the best of your abilities, right? It's just like riding a bike, right? Once you learn to ride a bike, it usually starts on training wheels. Your parents help steer you down the sidewalk or down the road, the driveway to you. Learn to get your balance, and you're off, right? Once you learn how to ride that bike, you never forget. Any time in your life you jump on that bike, maybe a little wobbly, first couple pedals, but you're off, right? It's the same thing with walking with Christ, walking in freedom, amen? The more you grow in Christ, the more you get to know him, the more you begin to walk in that perfect peace, in that freedom from addictions, in that freedom from the bondage of sin, and the next thing you know, clicks, just like riding that bike, clicks. Your walk can click. It clicks, and you begin to walk in that freedom and in that first perfect peace. I'm not saying you're not going to get hit once in a while with anxieties or fears, but as soon as you recognize it, right, and you understand the truthful word of God, you can grab a hold of that imagination and cast it down. Amen. Amen. So if there's anybody here that has never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to do that today. Amen. <laughs> you can do it on your own accord, but when you do it, tell somebody, hey, I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Make it a verbal profession to someone. Amen. There's people here that are struggling with anxiety, fears, and they, there's all kinds of them. Fears come in all different kinds of costumes, right? We need to release it to the Lord. I'm going to ask you to do that today. Just give it to God, man. Don't hold on to it anymore. Speak to it like it's an enemy intruding your house, wanting to harm your family, right? Whatever it is, you have no right here. You have no place here. In Jesus' name, I command you to leave and do not return. Amen. Holy Spirit, I welcome your peace. I welcome your understanding. Show me peace. Show me understanding. Help me walk in what you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. As you begin to do these things, you'll begin to walk in them, amen. Amen. So uh, I want to pray us out, and if the worship band wants to come up. If anybody wants prayer for anything before you leave, uh, come see, see myself or someone else from the core team, and we want to pray with you before you leave, no matter what you're, whatever you're dealing with, whether it be financial needs, whether it be uh, addictions, whether it be hurt, habits, hang-ups, whatever it is, 
We want to pray with you. We want to watch that stuff leave and you begin to walk in the blessings of Christ. Amen. God is good, man. He can do it. So, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all you've done, all you continue to do. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for truth. Lord God, I ask that you would just continue to show us it. Lord, help us move in compassion. Help us move in your kingdom authority. Help us advance your kingdom and see people experience you and walk in that. And help them help others walk in that as well, Lord. And we just give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it, Lord. I pray you bless Preacher Jim and his wife Jackie and uh, the Freedom Network in Jesus' mighty name.